Good morning, Coquille Christian Community Church, uh, and everybody else watching on the web, wherever you may be with your friends and family this morning. We're just glad that you can join us in whatever, uh, whatever way you can, whether it be uh, on a couch, on your phone, on your tablet, whatever you may have with you. We're just grateful that you can be with us to spend some time with God and worship and to hear his word this morning. So go ahead and just join us in worship this morning after we pray. Lord, Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us, God. We thank you for, for being the leader of our lives and all that you do, God. And we just want to give you all the praise and glory this morning. Amen. Blooming red in the drought There's a quenching rain In the wings of the gathering clouds oh, Lift your eyes And look to the horizon now Oh, the still is over us Reach up from the dust And call it down Just be dry bones. I may just be dry bones, stripped of sinew and skin. But the wind of your spirit will raise me up again. I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes, I look to the horizon now. Oh, the still the sun. I'll sing your name, sing it out till the sky spills over. Oh, I can hear, I can hear that thunder. I'll sing your name, sing it out till the sky spills over. I hear the rolling thunder, feel the pouring rain. My heart is filled with wonder, only you remain. I see the new horizon coming my way. I lift my eyes, I look to the horizon now. Oh, still the song of me, fall down on your knees and cry aloud. I'll sing your name, sing it out till the sky spills over.
walls between us by the cross you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, oh, oh. Feel the darkness shaking. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. I hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, oh, oh. And what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive, cause you're alive, and what a love we found. Death can't hold us down. We shout it out. We're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, oh, oh. Lord, your love awakens me. Oh, oh, oh. Lord, your love awakens me. Amen. Yes, Lord. Lord, I come into your holy place. I stand in awe of your cleansing grace. Who am I that you would care for me? I go if I the one who died for me. Glorify, glorify, let your name be lifted up and glorify, let the earth tremble at your name, let your name be lifted up and glorify. commit my life day by day as a living 
sacrifice Oh, who am I That you would care for me Lord, I glorify The one who died for me Sing it out to him this morning. Glorify. 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 Let your name be lifted up and glorify. Let the earth tremble at your name. Let your name be lifted up and glorified. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Let your name be lifted up and glorified. Amen. Lord, Lord, we love you. Lord, we just want to give you so much praise, so much love, and so much glory. And every light to just shine on you and illuminate you for those who just can't see you in whatever darkness may be around, God, that your light shine through and that you just get all the glory. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Good morning, my name's Jim. I'm one of the elders here at the church. And uh, today is, at this time, we come to our communion and offering time. We'll be giving you some information on the screen about the offering, but communion is something that's very important to us. Many of you are tuning in, maybe you're not a regular member of our congregation. We have people even as far away as Zambia that's been, that have been t tuning us in. We, are, uh, we take communion very seriously here. It is the original symbol of Christianity. I know we think of the cross as being the symbol, but that didn't come in until 300 years after our Lord uh, was crucified. The fish came in uh, between 20 and 50 years afterwards and became a, a symbol for people to show that they were Christians by putting the fish into something that they were doing. But the symbol that Jesus gave us, that he left us, was a symbol of the bread and wine. And we remember him in that every week when we gather together at our church. At the night before he died, Jesus had his disciples together. He broke bread. He passed it around when they all had to bread. He said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. And then he passed the cup around. And he said, this is a symbol of my body blood which will be shed for you and it was shed for the purpose of the new covenant a new relationship between man and God that's what Jesus was all about to bring us into a right relationship with God and we remember him in the bread and the juice Lord we thank you so much for your sacrifice we look at our lives now and we are concerned about some of the sacrifices we have at the present moment, but compared to what you did, it's nothing. Lord, we just thank you for being with us at this time, and we thank you that we are able every week to remember 
the sacrifice you made for us. Amen. It's good to have you with us this Sunday. Uh, On Palm Sunday a few weeks ago, I skipped over a a section of Scripture as we went through the week leading up to Easter morning. And I said I would bring it up in two or three weeks. So so here we are. Uh, Over the past few weeks, several people have asked me, do you think COVID-19 is God's punishment upon our nation or upon the world? I do have an answer. Uh, It is uh, one my wife and I have now used quite often. It actually comes from a TV commercial. Uh, I don't really know whose commercial it was, but my wife and I thought it was quite humorous, and we use it often now. Two teenage boys are stranded on a dark road, and one is talking to his father on the phone in which he says, I know what a lug wrench wrench is, Dad. And then he turns to his friend and picks up a tool like this and says, is this a lug wrench? To which the other young man replies, maybe. And so any time now that my wife and I have a question, which we do not want to answer, or one in which we do not know the answer. We turn to the other and say, maybe. So is COVID-19 God's punishment? Maybe. And I don't like maybes. I really like things that are written in stone. And one thing we do know for sure is that any time there is a national tragedy or, or a, a war in the Middle East that, that, uh, that people start attending church more often, at least for a few weeks. I have always remembered a quote from Billy Graham who said, if God does not punish America for her sins, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. One of my favorite prophets of the Old Testament is Amos. Amos was from Tekoa, a town about six miles uh, southeast of Bethlehem. And although he lived in Judah, he, he spoke for God to the northern kingdom, to Israel. But what I really like uh, about Amos is his method of uh, preaching. He, wh- uh, what he does in the opening chapters of his book he, he starts by naming the sins of the countries or, or the, the states and cities around Israel. For example, he, he names their sin and, and then gives a short uh, com- comment about what their punishment will be. And, and so he starts with Damascus and Philistia, uh, with Tyre and Edom and Moab and Judah And he gives a short description of their sins, of each nation, and the punishment they will receive. And what Amos is doing, really, is he's setting up the people of Israel. I mean, for example, imagine if we had a prophet in the United States that that spoke for God, and in this day, he went on national television and said, God is going to punish Russia for their meddling in our elections, or, or God is going to punish Iran for its deception and its cruelty, or God will punish China for, for, for its lack of concern for other nations by releasing COVID-19 beyond its borders. I, I imagine if that was to happen, there would be a number of, of people who would be cheering that God is finally intervening in our situation. But it's at that point that Amos lets the other shoe drop. And he starts to list in detail 
the sins of Israel. Because, he says, Israel of all nations should have known better. Because God had brought them out of Egypt. God says to them, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. You have had my law and my prophets. In other words, Israel should have known better. And God reveals that he is going to punish Israel for very specific sins that he has recorded. So with that introduction, let's consider the conversation between Jesus and his disciples about the end of the world and other minor problems. If you look at the text, I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 24, starting at verses 1 through 14. For almost any time, there is again a world disaster or war in the Middle East. People start rolling out new prophecy charts or, or new studies of revelation. So let's listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 24. And this again is before Jesus is going to the cross before Passover, just a couple days before Passover, and Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, tell us when these things will be, and what will be the, the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you do not get alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to, throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. By the way, uh, I have a, a new speculative date for the end of the world. Uh, I, I mean, for example, Scripture tells us that with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And also, there are just numerous third-day stories all through Scripture. I, I mean, when Joshua marched around Jericho before the battle progressed and the, the walls fell down, they were to march around for three days. When, when Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, dead, the, uh, it was three days that he, in fact, Jesus said, there will be no sign given to you except that as Noah was three days in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days in the earth. And of course, then the resurrection. So there's all of these third day stories. And so I simply decided that, that uh, since a day is as a thousand years, if we take three days, that's 3,000 years, and we do it from Easter morning, that means that uh, the end of the age might be in the year 
3,033, which means we have about 1,013 years to go, and which means you and I really don't have to worry about it. Jesus informs us that no one knows the day or the hour. And most likely, we will all be with the Lord or somewhere else when this world comes to an end. I have always liked a statement by Mark Twain, who, when somebody asked him, are you ever worried about those things that you do not understand in Scripture? To which he replied, no, not at all. He says, but those things that any darn fool can understand, they've kept me awake all night. So instead of spending time trying to figure out when the end will come, let's hear what Jesus said that we should be doing in the now or in the meantime. First, he says, do not be led astray. Uh, Quite honestly, I, I think the devil would just love to have Christians engaged and debating about the end times so much so that they and they argue about revelation or whatever, so much so that they don't tell anybody else about Jesus. One of my mentors, Myron Taylor, once wrote this. He said, the revelation is one of the great books of the Bible. The only book that promises a blessing to its hearers. However, it is one of the most abused and misunderstood books. For it has been the happy hunting ground for cranks and crackpots for many generations. Let me give you the best commentary I think I ever read about the entire book of Revelation in one sentence, and it is this. I've read the back of the book, and God's side wins. That's all you and I really need to know. Jesus said, don't be led astray. How can we keep from doing that? How how can you and I specifically keep from being led astray? First of all, we need to know the Word. This year, one of the things we've been doing here at Coquille is using as a study guide a book titled Core 52. Uh, In fact, it has one of the verses really that deal with the last times that we're studying this week. It's, It's from Daniel chapter... Uh, I think it's chapter 7, verse uh, 13, 7, 13, for he says that uh, in that book, it says, the Son of Man, uh, cl- excuse me, behold, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And that ties in with the things that Jesus said. Jesus identified himself with this individual many times in the New Testament. But we need to know God's Word. Quite honestly, if you are positive of the truth, you will not be led astray by lies. And quite honestly, I know a number of people who claim to be Christian, who this day could tell me more about Pat Brady than they can about Jesus. So first, know God's Word. Second, pray. There's an old passage that many people know by heart from 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Know God's word and pray. I I think it's interesting that that passage from 2 Chronicles is written to God's people. Like the passage in Revelation to the churches of the Revelation where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open the door, I will come in and be with him. And that passage in particular is written to a church to God's people. So know God's word, pray, and third, be part of a local church. We need each other. I mean, the scripture teaches us that we, Peter declares that 
that we are to be living stones built into a spiritual house. I know a, a number of missing bricks, if you want to put it that way. There are just too many one another passages for us to be allowed to think that we can survive outside a local church. Hebrews 10.35 is, is just as inspired as all the rest of Scripture. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the custom of some. Right now, I mean, we can't be together physically, but we can in the Spirit, and we can by phone. We can call each other up and, and talk about the verse we're studying together as God's people here at Coquille or, or any other passage. We, we can encourage one another and build up one another through prayer and through phone calls, a number of ways we can encourage each other. As we meet together, it, it, so if we know God's word and we pray and we meet together as God's people, we will not be led astray. In fact, quite honestly, I, uh, I, I think if you will bear with me on the term, I believe the Holy Catholic Church, notice I did not say Roman Catholic, I just said the Holy Catholic Church, which, which Catholic means universal. So the, the church universal around the world, I, I think overall, the churches around the world keep the church on track in the truth of God's word. That is, sometimes the church may go astray a little bit, but there's always those reformers that bring the church back to God's truth. Martin Luther, Wesley, just all through history, there have been those who bring the church back to center. So that's the first thing that Jesus said we are to do. We are not to be led astray. But then in, in the rest of Matthew 24 and then into chapter 25, the, the section we skipped over on Palm Sunday, Jesus gives four illustrations what, that indicate what we should be doing or that we should be doing two main things. The first one is that we should be watchful or to say it another way, we should always be ready. In Matthew 43 and 44, he says, but know this. Now, I'm going to paraphrase this just a little bit, but you can go back and check the text. This is a pretty accurate paraphrase. He says, but know this. If I had known what part of the night the thief was coming to steal my chainsaw, a farm boss, model, seven, or model 271, serial number, 5072642844 If I had known when the thief was coming to steal my chainsaw I would have watched and not let my garage being broken into That's kind of what Jesus is saying here and he says at the end of that he says therefore you must always be ready in Matthew 24, 45 to 51, Jesus gives an illustration of a servant who doesn't do what is expected of him or what is required because his master has delayed in returning. And Jesus is saying that we are to be watchful and that we are to be faithful. Then in Matthew 25, he reemphasizes these same themes. The first is a parable of ten maidens who are waiting for a wedding to begin. And they take lamps to go meet the bridegroom. And five of them have had, had enough oil to be ready for the, for the journey. But five didn't bring enough oil. And they beg the others to give them their oil. And they say, no, if we give it to you, we won't have enough. And so the five that didn't have enough go off to buy some more. But while they're gone, the bridegroom comes. And those who were ready attended the wedding feast and those who were not ready were shut out and could not enter. 
And again, the message from Jesus is that you and I should always be prepared for his return. And then the final illustration in Matthew 25, 14 to 30 is what we often refer to as the parable of the talents. A man went on a journey and entrusted his property to his servants. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and entrusted it to them to, to work with until he returned. And then in verse 19 it says this. Now... After a long time, so far it's been over 2,000 years, and if you want my calculation, even though it's said with a little tongue-in-cheek, we have another 1,013 years to go. After a long time, the master of these servants came to settle accounts. And to two, to those that had invested what he had given to them, and they returned to their master all that he had given and then some more, he said to these two servants, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because you have been faithful over a little, you will be given much. But to one, to one, he said, you are a worthless servant. And he did nothing with what had been given to him. The illustrations of Jesus point to two things. That we are to always be ready. And that we are always to be faithful to our calling. Let me reemphasize something else that Jesus made clear to his disciples at the beginning of what he was saying. He said, you should not be alarmed. Don't be afraid. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Don't be alarmed or afraid. Remember that God still has the whole world in his hands, and our God is not frustrated. Hang in there. Don't give up. For the command all through the revelation at the end of the Bible is to be faithful unto death, and Jesus says, I will give to you the crown of life. There is a great verse tucked away in Galatians 6, verse 9, where Paul writes this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Sometimes, I think all of us, once in a while, come to that point when we, we feel like giving up. I heard Wayne Smith tell a story about uh, the worst football game in history. Georgia Tech beat Cumberland College 222 to nothing. Now that's a bad day on the gridiron. It was so bad that the quarterback of Cumber Cumberland College fumbled the ball, and it rolled over to the feet of his buddy on the team. And he yelled at him, pick up the ball. But Georgia Tech had been beating them up so bad, the guy yelled back to the quarterback, he says, you pick it up, you dropped it. Don't give up. Don't become weary in well-doing. For at the proper time, we will reap the harvest. A few years ago, I was given a beautiful picture of faithfulness. Kay and I, my wife, we were in a nursing home visiting with her mother, and next to me sat an elderly gentleman who was feeding his wife. And I chatted with him a little bit, discovered they'd been married for over 70 years. And he, as he fed her, I said, how long have you been doing this? And he said, I come here every night, have been for the last two years. He said, she doesn't remember me, but I remember her. And I said to him, let me shake your hand. I admire a man who keeps his word to be faithful unto death. Let's pray. 
our God and Father. Lord, as we see all the events in our world taking place, some terrible things that happen. Not only the plagues of history and world wars, the coronavirus that's currently going around our world. Sometimes, Lord, we, we question, we wonder what's going to happen. But help us to realize that when we trust in you, all the issues that are important are settled. For because of you, we will be given a crown of life when we endure to the end. Lord, help everyone who hears this message not only be ready for your return at any moment, but to be faithful even unto death. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we are so thankful that you have joined with us in this time together, and we pray that uh, as you worship with us, you will be encouraged through God's Word. Have a great week. God bless. We thank you once again for joining us, and we can't wait to be with you again next week. And uh, we just want you to be safe out there. And this is a great time to be with your families, to be with God, and to just uh, be in His presence and let that, let that be what carries us through higher than ever. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. See you next time.